geeks and geek ets, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. V Gates, hola, bonjour, <laughs> mushy mushy to all the international listeners to this, another episode of Ask Chuck Dixon, where you get to ask me questions about what I do for a living and what I do for a living is I write comic books. Let's get right to the first of your many fascinating queries. David Jordan, I was thinking about how positive stories about pioneers and conquistadors are a genre we may never see again, and it's a shame. Do you have any interest in writing stories about these subjects? Yeah, uh, with your, uh, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, basically uh, translates to uh, excluding uh, white people, uh, and diversity seems to be uh, sans any kind of history about white people. Uh, or Europeans, or whatever, uh, and especially shown in any kind of positive light. And uh, the Conquistadors, um, they get a bad rap. <laughs> um, yeah, they did some terrible things, but who didn't back in the day? Uh, as Mel Brooks refers to all history, when things were rotten, uh, you know, cruelty, barbarism, uh, genocide, these were all norms across the globe. No culture was free of them. Uh, hopefully we, uh, well, we're still not free of them, are we? Uh, slavery, genocide, uh, ethnic cleansing, things like that. is still going on today uh, in many parts of the world. Um, luckily here, it's simply erasing people uh, through censorship rather than actual murder. Uh, Anyway, the conquistadors get a bad rap. Uh, I, I think the conquistadors were heroes simply because they took down the Aztecs, which was one sick society. And uh, so many people say, well, you know, conquistadors had no uh, right to come in and uh, do that. But apparently all of the neighboring uh, Native American tribes settled around the Aztecs were more than happy to join the conquistadors uh, in their struggle to take down the Aztecs because they had no use for the Aztecs either. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, it's basically a, a, a serial killing culture, you know, based on, uh, you know, blood magic and murder. And, uh, just, you know, I mean, when, when your enemy is wearing human skin, uh, it's kind of an indicator, you know, you're on the right side. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I'd love to write a story about this and uh, like the, there's some, you know, epic stuff here, um, uh, in, in the uh, battle between the Spanish conquistadors and, and the Aztecs, uh, you know, the Night of Sorrows and, and all the rest of it. Uh, there's some fantastic stuff there. And, um, but like I say, you know, um, and like you indicate, uh, you know, there's a, a move amongst a major a minority of a minority of a minority within our culture to sort of rewrite history um, so that, you know, uh, people of the Caucasian persuasion are always the bad guys. Uh, and, uh, you know, history is really not about good guys and bad guys. But in the case of the conquistadors versus the Aztecs, I think it's pretty clear cut uh, who was on the uh, side of the angels. Um, I, I certainly think that Mexico, as, as bad a shape as it is in now with the cartels, uh, probably be even worse if the Aztecs were the dominant culture uh, from then till now. Um, but yeah, like you said, you know, we, we, we're, but 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 I see an end to this this woke effort to um, you know change history or alter history or retell history from another light. Same thing with the pioneers. Um, so often, you know, the expansion westward is shown as, uh, you know, genocide against Native Americans and everything else. But these genocides were not committed by the pioneers. They were, they were a matter of government policy. Uh, this was not a necessarily a clash of cultures. Um, the, the policy of the United States government for, for quite a long time was the, the virtual or actual extinction of the Native Americans. They were seen as troublesome. They were seen as in the way. Um, I think it was, um, gee, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, apply this quote to someone who didn't actually say it, but, 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 you know, one ranking general was heard to say the only good Indian is a dead Indian. And that if you, if you read about 
the time period that that was the government's policy uh, to get rid of the Indians or, you know, corral them or make life inconvenient for them, uh, force them off of land that they were used to uh, roaming around on. And in order to facilitate this, um, our government invited people from all around the world to come here and go west. They said, you know, there's free land. You can go out there and free land. You can farm. You can do whatever the hell you want on this land. It'll be yours. Uh, you know, basically unlimited acreage and open range and all the rest. I mean, uh, this was an incredible opportunity for an awful lot of European immigrants whose, um, you know, if they had any kind of land holdings, which most of them didn't, uh, were the size of a postage stamp. I mean, they really couldn't uh, prosper under the conditions of, you know, serfdom, let's face it, in Europe. Uh, so they came here seeking opportunity. But nobody told them how dangerous it was going to be. Nobody told them that there was a hostile native population uh, who didn't want them there. And so a lot of these um, pioneers, um, you know, a lot of our forebears, uh, went west kind of ignorant of the dangers. And, you know, it's a tough trip anyway. Uh, you know, disease, exposure, you know, horrible weather conditions, starvation, dying of thirst, all of these things were possible going west, uh, further complicated by, uh, you know, the Lakota Sioux and the Cheyenne, and the Comanches, and the Apaches, uh, who, who, you know, would go on, let's face it, murder sprees. They would go on the warpath. They would destroy wagon trains and pioneer settlements because they didn't want them there. Okay, this was a clash of cultures, but one end of the equation wasn't expecting this. Uh, they weren't armed up. They weren't, you know, ready to fight because they weren't told that they would have to. They, just, they were just sold the bill of goods about, you know, countless acres of, you know, a pastoral setting that they could, you know, raise livestock on or cultivate or whatever. And so they were pretty much the sacrificial lambs. Uh, they were the cannon fodder for the Western movement and the settlement of the West as designed by uh, government policy back in Washington. And um, also they were used as, um, you know, an excuse to go to war against the Indians. You know, the latest Indian massacre was, you know, uh, enough reason uh, to uh, send out the army. And, and enough reason to, to go to war against the tribes. And if you read a history of this, uh, the, uh, the, the tribes in the, in the West, uh, the Plains tribes, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, the rest, uh, they, they tried to negotiate. They tried to negotiate in good terms. Uh, they quickly learned how the white man did business and, and made offers that were spurred by Washington because Washington didn't want to have an ongoing business relationship with um, the Native Americans. They just wanted them gone. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, I would certainly write, you know, in these, both of these areas of, of history. Uh, I, I find them both fascinating and I've, I've done extensive reading on both. So, yeah, if the opportunity arose, I would, I would leap in with both feet. Rebecca Charlan. Are there any particular characters or genres that you have not yet had an opportunity to write, but wish you could have? If yes, is there a story behind why you've never had the opportunity? Uh, well, I mean, famously or usually or typically I answer, I would love to do a long run on Fantastic Four uh, with Graham Nolan. Uh, we, we, we know what our first story would be. Uh, we know what our first arc would be, and uh, it would be awesome and it would be fun. Uh, it's never going to happen, but it's, 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 it's nice to dream. Uh, as far as genres, I've written in almost all of them. I've written um, two Westerns under my own name, uh, two more under a pseudonym. I'm halfway through a third Western. Obviously, I, I really like Westerns. Um, and uh, my, my, you know, I've just published my 12th uh, Levon uh, Cade book. Uh, you know, vigilante justice, you know, guy action kind of stuff, uh, you know, right up my alley, right in my wheelhouse. Um, I wrote Gomer's, a zombie novel, just to get that out of my system. <laughs> I, I had a high concept for a uh, a zombie novel, and, and, it, and it was in my head for years, and I, I 
finally wrote it. Uh, and, you know, these are all available. I've, I've written, you know, sort of hard-boiled crime. My novel Shrinkage, set in the 1970s, about a shoplifter, petty thief. And uh, I've written the post-apocalyptic stuff, you know, in addition to Gomer's. Uh, I wrote a novel of Winterworld, basically tells the origin of Scully, one of the lead characters in my Winterworld comic series. Uh, so I've, I've written in those genres. I, I wrote a vampire novel called Blooded, uh, basically to get a vampire novel out of my system. <laughs> I'll probably write a werewolf novel someday just to get that out of my system uh, as soon as I come up with a, a hook for a werewolf novel. And uh, I've written, you know, some sci-fi, uh, six books in the Bad Time series, a time travel series about Army Rangers. Um, you know, genres I really haven't tackled. I, I, you know, do a straight-up historical fiction book. Uh, I've got a, an idea for that um, that I'd like to work on. In fact, I've got two historical fiction books uh, concepts that, I, that I'd love to get to someday. And um, that's probably the last frontier for me because, you know, the, the, the amount of research required and everything else. But it, it looks like I'll be in a position in the next couple of years to have the time to do that kind of research that I think is needed to do a proper historical fiction novel. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to get to them eventually. I, I'm determined. Uh, as a mark of my determination, I mean, you know, uh, La Gringa, one of my Westerns, I... I had that in my head for 30 years before I wrote it. So uh, I realize I probably don't have 30 years left, but <laughs> I will get around to my two historical novels as soon as I, uh, you know, get a few other projects out of the way. But um, in any case, yeah, I mean, there's not really another genre I want to tackle. I, I'd love to go back to some of the genres I've done before and, and do some more entries in them, uh, particularly hard boiled crime and Western. So, but excellent question. Thank you so much. And uh, here is your dog, uh, Tika, who you were kind enough to send me a picture of. What a dog. Who's a good girl? Okay. Ian Potash, what are your thoughts on DC's finest line of reprints announced for later this year? They've suggested your Robin line like, might be in the future and announced, and the announced Batman book will reach your run in a handful of volumes uh, yeah, I just learned about this the other day, and uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy about it. I'm happy whenever they reprint my stuff, uh, not from an ego boost kind of thing, but uh, because there's cash in it for me. Uh, you know, DC sends out those quarterly royalty checks, and they're based on how much of your work they've utilized, and uh, I love seeing the reprints. Uh, there seems to be quite a few uh, volumes of my stuff being done recently. And uh, I think change in management at DC has prompted uh, them to go back and look at what actually used to sell in the past and think, well, if it's sold in the past, maybe people want to read it again. Or maybe people have fond memories of it. Or maybe the quality was high enough. It's worth revisiting. <laughs> but I'm just glad every time they do it from a uh, purely financial standpoint. Ryan Wilson. First off, want to say thank you for producing so much content from the 90s and 2000s that I love. Hey, I'm still writing. <laughs> Pick something out now. You might still love it. Uh, my first question is, during your time at DC and Marvel, how much interaction did you have with other writers to make sure your book would line up with other books? For example, during your Detective Comics, Robin, and Nightwing run at DC, did you have to constantly make sure your characters would be in the right place at the right time to make other Batman titles make sense? Was this more of the job of the editor, assistant editor, group editor, etc.? Uh, Rereading No Man's Land, which is my favorite Batman event, I noticed that every title added up perfectly in the timeline, even down to the minute in some cases. Meanwhile, I can't even tell when Batman and Detective Comics take place with one another. I've seen where Grant Morrison writing The Final Crisis basically had no contact with the people making the comics to set up to The Final Crisis. How can DC fail at such a high level with their events like this? Is the process always the same? Do you all have meetings to set up an entire year? Does Marvel and DC set up their upcoming series events the same way? Um, no. Um, DC, back in the day, it was, it was more highly organized. Marvel was never highly organized. Um, I mean, I, I went to lunches where uh, they would bring in the writers 
of a crossover event. And basically, it would all be hashed out over lunch, which is no way to do this. And then it'd be written in the Marvel style, uh, which means, you know, I was writing full script, but others were writing Marvel style, which means you'd get a, uh, um, sometimes like a six paragraph plot line for the issue that you were supposed to follow up on. And there was never enough detail in that plot line. And, and, and you know, you have to be very specific about things like locations and costuming and weaponry and things like that when you're doing these things so that one issue flows into the other without any kind of interruption. And because these issues would end on cliffhangers, you, you the cliffhanger has to look the same in the next issue as it did in the previous one. It has to be in the same setting, same time of day, things like that. Marvel never seemed to care about that kind of stuff. And so you would have this, you know, jarring change in lo in everything, costuming, setting, location, time of day, between the, you know, the cliffhanger at the end of one issue and the resolution of the cliffhanger at the, at the beginning of the next issue. Very frustrating to work on, uh, but I seem to be the only one frustrated. Everybody else just thought, hey, I got paid. I got my paycheck, so uh, who cares? Uh, I've always been more into the the quality of the work, the end product. This, this is the best we could do. And it never seemed to be a big concern with the, the, a lot of the Marvel editors and freelancers I worked with, sadly. Now, as I said, at DC, it was a whole different ballgame. Uh, when we did Batman events, we would um, be taken away to some resort. Uh, this is uh, this is a particularly large summit because we see the, a couple of the artists are here with us. Uh, Graham Nolan and, and Jim Ballant are here. Uh, usually it was just writers, editors, and associate editors. And uh, this was the infamous trip to what we called the Overlook Hotel, where uh, Denny O'Neill said that, you know, he and uh, his wife had honeymooned at this place in upstate New York. And it was just fabulous. And we would have such a great time having our retreat there. And uh, we spent three days at this place. Um, when we arrived, we found out that it was being renovated. And uh, <laughs> so we were in one of the very few rooms that wasn't um, stripped to the studs <laughs> and, and uh it was it was kind of a miserable experience uh very much like uh the overlook and the shining and uh but uh but we would spend days with you, you see the the whiteboards in the background uh there would be multiple whiteboards i remember a particularly intense summit in the middle of nightfall where there was a minimum of six whiteboards just crammed with uh jordan gorfinkel's uh handwriting and uh, as we figured out plot lines and, you know, cliffhangers and resolutions and setups and payoffs and uh, all the rest of that. Uh, and it was, um, you know, it was a complex but fun project. It, it was it was hard work, but it was fun, too. I mean, uh, and we all played nice together and we were all on the same page. We all wanted to do the, uh, the highest quality work that we could. And uh, it was a great place to be. A great time to be working at DC. And um, this is how um, the Superman crew who did Death of Superman also worked. And uh, largely all the way up through to No Man's Land, this is how it was done. Uh, this was, you know, under Denny. Superman crew was doing the same thing under Mike Carlin. Uh, you know, uh, and, and the same sort of feel, you know. Uh, creators who were interested in doing their best work, who were interested in producing a quality product, uh, working together, making sure it was organized, making sure the reader, you know, uh, had the uh, the best entertainment experience possible, you know, created earnestly by people who were very interested in, in doing that, in bringing them high quality entertainment. Um, now, when you get to anything crossovers involving Grant Morrison, Yes, the rules were like you described. Grant Morrison would send down edicts and his editors would largely, largely just communicate with the various editors and creators across the line. And um, very often, even if you were supposed to have a meeting with Grant Morrison, he, he would send the surrogate instead. <laughs> he wouldn't actually show up to the meeting. I remember having meetings uh, with crossovers involving Grant Morrison, and um, he sent Mark Mark Miller in, instead of himself. 
uh, and Mark Miller would speak for him. And, and nothing against Mark, uh, except that he talked very fast and has a very thick accent. <laughs> and largely, especially when he was younger and, and super enthusiastic, not that he's not super enthusiastic now, uh, he was, and his accent seemed to be even thicker. He was often very difficult to understand. <laughs> But really, I, I, I like Mark a lot, and I really dig his enthusiasm, even to this day. Uh, and obviously, hugely successful, probably the most successful comic book writer of our age. Uh, but he was sort of um, Grant Morrison's cat's paw, and, and we would meet with him instead. And um, also, Grant, Grant Morrison was... You know, most infamously on One Million, which I'm not the only writer uh, who has, you know, sleepless nights over the One Million crossover, which was a company-wide crossover in which the conceit was that each issue of every title that month would be the one millionth issue, as if uh, far, far into the future, uh, all of these titles would have their one millionth issue from a still ex existent DC Comics. And um, the problem was, is you had the toxic mix of, of Grant Morrison with editor Dan Raspler. Dan Raspler, uh, he was running the crossover. He was like the group editor for the crossover. And this is a toxic mix because Dan Raspler was more into office politics and probably the cruelest editor to um, freelancers I've, I've ever met in my life. Uh, if he's listening to this, he's probably proud of, of <laughs> holding this record of, you know, being largely despised amongst the freelancer community because he would just make arbitrary changes to things. And normally when you did a crossover, uh, as in one million, that you know, you're sent like this 20 page outline of you know what it is, what the Uber story of the of the uh crossover event is. Um and I'm not gonna blame Grant for this. I'm gonna blame first of all, it was a Grant Morrison overview. So it was very uh cosmic, very uh um uh, you know dense. Uh, very odd. Uh, and then you mix in Dan Raspler, who kept making, he and Grant kept morphing it and changing it as it went along. So we all got this 20 page outline, and then we would get notes. As we were writing our issues, we would get notes. You know, uh, we've changed this, we've changed that, we've changed the name of this character. We've, so you're, you're writing and then having to rewrite according to the changes to the core crossover and then rewriting and rewriting um, to the point where you don't know what you're writing anymore. Uh, and it wasn't just me. I mean, it was, a you know, stalwarts. I mean, studs like Dan Jurgens were saying, I, I'm, I'm so confused now. I don't even understand my own story. Um, and I think at one point I just, I just left an issue of Robin to someone else to finish. Because I, I couldn't understand I couldn't understand the story anymore. Uh, thankfully, it only interrupted everything for one month. This wasn't an ongoing, you know, long-term crossover, so we all just had to put up with it for one month. But it, it, it was, it, it, as you have read or suspect or heard, um, yeah, it, Grant Morrison run events were chaotic, and I'm not going to blame that on Grant. Uh, I'm going to blame it on his editors uh, who either indulged him or just used it as an opportunity to, you know, horsewhip the rest of us, and, you know, punish us for some uh, <laughs> unstated wrong we'd done them in the past. I don't know. I don't know what, what the hell was going on there in 1 million, but it was the opposite of how DC usually ran things. Um, the last Big crossover I was involved with was Last Laugh, which was largely run by uh, myself and Scott Beatty, and it was in the you know the days following uh, Denny O'Neill's retirement, and uh, sometimes it was a bit of an uphill battle, uh, but it wasn't done in a retreat fashion or anything else. Um, Scott and I laid out the original uh, 
um, the, the, the core miniseries, which was going to be released week in weekly installments. Um, and then the, the high concept of Last Laugh, if you've never read it, is, is that the, the Joker escapes from prison after having um, poisoned all of the convicts with a formula that jokerized them, that basically made them unpredictable uh, psychotics like himself, uh, even made them pale and gave them green hair if they had hair. And, um, and that was the, that was the conceit. And the, and the idea was that, um, you know, you didn't have to follow our storyline or anything else, but this gave you an opportunity for one month in your books to have your hero face a jokerized version of a villain they had never met before. And we thought that a lot of, uh, writers and artists would really dig this idea, you know, because it's, you know, it's just basically, it's a one shot story. And you go wild, and the idea is very simple. Your hero meets a villain they've never met before, but this villain has been amped up by being jokerized. And, uh, you know, sort of a musical chairs kind of deal. Um, and so we, we wrote this out, and then Scott and I spent one very long day at DC meeting with each editor of, of, each, of, of, of all the titles to tell them about the concept and, and explain it to them. And, you know, it's very simple. It's very painless. This is what your creators would have to do. Uh, personally, um, something this high concept, I, I've been involved in stories like this, you know, crossovers created by other people. And, um, and I, I thought it was cool. You know, uh, oh, I get to do this one-off story that sort of either breaks the rules or turns things on its head for my lead character. That's cool. That's cool. Some editors liked the idea. Others were either resistant or indifferent. Um, and a lot of creators did not take the opportunity presented to them. And they simply had them, their hero meet a villain that their hero had met many times before, only Jokerize. And, and to me, that wasn't as interesting as meeting a brand new villain, a villain they had never encountered before Jokerize. So, uh, but that's how it was done. It was basically, it, there was no summit. There was no retreat. It was all done in one day, all done through editors. We never got to speak to any creators uh, on it. And we never received any correspondence from creators. Nobody, nobody asked any questions uh, or the rest of it. Uh, but that said, uh, it sold very well. The Last Laugh crossover outsold uh, Our World at War, which was the previous cross-country company um, crossover which had been highly promoted and highly pushed. This was going to be huge. Uh, and then ours, our humble little uh, one-month stunt, uh, outsold them uh, quite a bit. And um, uh, and I'm, I'm still happy. Scott and I are still very happy with uh, our core miniseries, how the story of it, how it turned out. And, uh, and then also, you know, I got the right, you know, the issues – my regular comics at the time, uh, Robin, uh, Birds of Prey, uh, Detective, uh, I got to write them, you know, within this crossover. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's that about the difference between Marvel and DC, the stark difference between Marvel and DC when it came to approaching crossovers. Okay. Uh, I should say in the days of Jim Shooter, it was, it was different. But I wasn't involved in any Jim Shooter inspired crossovers. Hey, if if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Uh, if you have, thank you so much. It really helps build this channel, and that's all I'm going to say about it this week. Kenny Todd, when you wrote the Punisher Batman crossover, why do another one with Asbats? Was there a friendly rivalry between you and Denny? What did he think of yours? What did you think of his? Personally, I enjoyed yours better, but I did like his as well. Um, well, basically, the idea was is that uh, we were going to have two Batman meets Punisher crossovers, one published by DC and run out of DC, one published by Marvel and, and run out of Marvel. Um, now, be, for some reason, uh, Archie Goodwin was my editor, even though he was at DC, he was the editor of my Marvel project. Of course, Archie Goodwin had long been associated with Marvel, so I don't think anybody question that. 
Uh, but but the thing is that each company wanted a bite of the apple, basically. Um, as Tom DeFalco always said when it came to crossovers, what's in it for us? <laughs> and that's what anybody has to say, what's in it for us? And uh, what was in it for Marvel was to get the best selling of the two uh, books uh, because it was Johnny Romita Jr. on the art. Uh, I think Dale Keown. Was it Dale Keown or was it Barry? I forget his last name. Who did, um, I can't remember. Barry Kitson, I think, did the, the Asbats. Um, so you had Johnny Romita Jr. and the real Batman. This was Bruce Wayne Batman. It wasn't Asbats. Uh, and I think that, that helped sell it. And I think Marvel promoted theirs more than DC did. And... Um, there was no real friendly rivalry. I mean, Denny was going to write his. I mean, thankfully, he wrote the Asbats one. I didn't want to write the Asbats one. And I wanted to work with Johnny again. Uh, so um, it, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> it, 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 yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I would have written the Asbats thing differently than, than Denny did. I didn't always agree with how Denny approached things but you know i'm not saying he was wrong it's just we we'd had a different approach uh and but mine was like just balls out punisher meets batman i had so many things i wanted to do with this story uh it had been i i had i had pushed for a batman punisher crossover for two years uh and couldn't convince tom defalco to go forward with it uh, don daly and i would routinely bring up doing a, a Batman Punisher crossover because, you know, as a natural fit, I was writing both characters. So it just seemed like, hey, this would work out and it'd be a big enough event. We could get uh, uh, Johnny, Johnny Jr. back. Uh, and, you know, eventually it was DC who made the approach, you know, hey, why don't we do this? Uh, Batman is like super popular now. Punisher is is popular now let's let's get this together and so that's that's how that happened and i was so happy to have uh archie as uh editor. i don't i don't know what denny ever thought of the story um he generally liked my stuff uh archie really liked this story although he he said he he cringed at the joker's uh joke at the beginning of the story about the guy being yellow uh <laughs> But, you know, I couldn't resist that gag. Uh, but Denny did remark, he did remark on uh, the ultimate encounter between Punisher and Joker, where Joker psychoanalyzes uh, both uh, Batman and Punisher uh, as a means of stalling the Punisher from killing him, buying time. And uh, Denny simply said you you think a lot about this stuff <laughs> that was which i found was a, a high compliment um he enjoyed the sequence but he wasn't going to come right out and say that he just said you, you think a lot about this stuff so <laughs> twin spin what do you know kenny todd again do you think batman and wonder woman would make a good couple it's been teased here and there does batman deserve to be happy even for a little while they did it with Earth 2 Batman. Does Batman want to be happy? That's the question. You can't make someone happy if they don't want to be happy. You can, you know, um, to, to, to quote my good pal Greg Quapis once again, uh, you can decide to be happy. <laughs> but I don't think Batman wants that. He doesn't think he deserves it. And I don't see him as a good fit for Wonder Woman. Um, you know, on, on her side, you know, yeah, he seems kind of troubled and complex. Maybe I can fix him. Uh, you know, women like that kind of guy, but I don't think it would take too long to figure out, ah, you can't fix Bruce. <laughs> he's not going to change for anybody. Uh, he thinks he's fine just the way he is. And, um, also just the disparity. I mean, she's, you know, basically a goddess. I mean, talk about punching above your weight. Uh, Superman and Wonder Woman, I could see because they're kind of on par with one another. Also, Batman doesn't want help from anybody. Uh, I'm not saying he's sexist. He, he doesn't want help from men or women. He wants to do it on his own. And uh, it kind of messes with the whole Batman thing if his, if his girlfriend is this super-powered, you know, Amazonian mythic figure. Uh, 
Uh, it's just not a good fit. And I don't see him having a lot of time for her. <laughs> He's kind of a busy guy. He's got his hobbies. Uh, so, you know, that's not good. Not that she has plenty of time, but she seems to have more, you know, me time than, you know, a lot of the heroes. Uh, you know, between her adventures, she's, uh, you know, she's kicking back a little bit more. But uh, Batman's schedule is pretty much 24-7. And, uh, it's not, not a good way to do a relationship. Also, it's a long... <laughs> It's it's a long distance relationship. She's all the way out there on Themyscira. He's in Gotham. He ain't leaving Gotham. He ain't traveling to see his girlfriend. Where do they meet in the middle? I don't know. What's in the middle between Amazon Island and Gotham? So Asgard? I don't know. Oh, triple spin. What an honor for you. Uh, <laughs> Kenny Todd again. I'm curious what you thought about the remake of Day of the Jackal. I really was shocked to have seen Bruce Willis as a bad guy, but I loved his performance. It did make me watch the original, loved it. Um, yeah, I don't, why would you remake this? Uh, Day of the Jackal, the original, um, with uh, the actor whose name is uh, escaping me right now in the lead, uh, is just such a wonderfully deliberately paced story. Uh, it's it's um, even though it's it, it directed by uh, an American director, uh, Franklin Schaffner, um, James Fox, uh, Franklin Schaffner. It it, it um, it's paced so much like a French thriller of the period, like a, a Melville uh, French thriller, and uh, really works. Really cranks up the suspense without any hysteria. Now I have never seen the remake i largely stayed away from it because uh it was a dreamworks it was an early dreamworks uh production and uh i found their stuff to be very tepid uh dreamworks really only had success when they teamed with another studio but these early um early efforts by dreamworks were kind of you know lukewarmly received by critics and the audience uh they were kind of like half-baked remakes half-baked kind of thriller ideas um their idea of what a michael bay movie would look like um if it had no testosterone so i kind of stayed away from it although i will watch it now because i did i did get a copy i'm a big bruce willis fan and i'll, I'll i will check it out and tell you what i think uh you know you inspired me to find it and uh and put it in the uh to watch list so I'll I'll share my opinion anon. Bill Robertson. I was at Happy Valley Comics and Collectibles Con in State College, Pennsylvania last week and discovered even more of your old epic work, Car Warriors. I found the first two issues in some 50-cent long boxes. I vaguely recognized the logo from seeing it sporadically over the years and opened an issue to check it out. I was very pleased to see your name in the credits. The next day, I found the entire four issues in fantastic condition for $2. Deal. So far, I've read the first two, and it's a great story. It has similarities to Law Dog, and I wonder if they maybe originated from the same idea. Yeah, um, Car Warriors was based on a Steve Jackson game, um, you know, a strategy game. Uh, guess what you call board game? Role play game? I don't know. Anyway, I never played the game. Uh, but they gave me a list of characters and the concept, and it's pretty much Death Race 2000. And uh, so I jumped on it, and it was me and then Steve Dillon, who I'd never worked with before, and Phil Winslade on inks. And Phil did these fantastic covers for it. And, um, you know, I, I like Steve Dillon's work a lot, but, man, I'm a huge Phil Winslade fan uh, to this day. I'm, I'm, I'm loving Lawless, which is running in 2000 AD or, or, or Judge Dredd magazine. I, I don't know which. And, um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was very road warrior-ish, uh, but there was a lot of like dark humor and uh, it, it was a blast to work on. Uh, and it was kind of, in a weird way, my first shot at The Simpsons because I, I created a, a family modeled after The Simpsons called the Wysockies. And uh, they were, they were, you know, there was Homer and Marge and Bart, and Lisa and, and Maggie, <laughs> you know, uh, sort of, you know, stand-ins for them and, and some of the humor and uh, borrowed relationships. Uh, probably a little subtle, but they, they were the inspiration for this, you know, average American family who decides to uh, en enter this death race 
um, in the in their family station wagon. <laughs> uh, and I, I remember uh, the race runs across the state of Michigan. Uh, they have to cross the, um, the, the, oh God, I forget the name of the bridge that goes up to the Upper Peninsula. But that was the setting, because I didn't want to do the usual roadway or desert setting or anything like that. I wanted to do something different. And uh, But it was fun. It was a lot of fun to write. Uh, Carl Potts was my editor on it. And he basically ran interference between me and Steve Jackson, who kept trying to, who wanted the, me to make changes in the story. And, and Carl just basically said, just leave Chuck alone, which, which I'm eternally grateful for, um, that I was allowed to write this without a lot of interference from the licensor. Uh, was it an inspiration for Law Dog? No. I, I like writing badass guys in badass cars. Um, a law dog's car travels between dimensions. It's big, you know, it's a big ass American muscle car. And uh, yeah, I mean, there, there was no direct correlation between the two. Uh, I just think, you know, guys in really, uh, you know, bad motor scooters are, um, you know, real macho guys in, 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 in big, powerful cars uh, is kind of cool, you know. And obviously, the American public thinks so. Uh, Burt Reynolds based the whole career on it. Woolwich. My question is about Mickey Mouse. Now that he's out of copyright, what can you do with this character? Considering Disney's deep pockets, what would you do with him? I assume by deep pockets, you're, you're referring to Walt Disney lawyers who you know just sort of hang on hooks until they're needed, until they're unleashed, they're let out of their cages <laughs> to go after innocent people. And, and sue the living daylights out of them. Um, yeah, the Steamboat Bill, the first uh, Mickey Mouse cartoon, has fallen into public domain, um, but only the elements within it. Uh, we see Pete, but Pete, Pete isn't peg leg Pete in this, as he was in the comic strips. So it's going to be Pete with two, two feet. Uh, you got Mickey, you got Minnie, and that's pretty much it. There's no Goofy, there's no Donald. Uh, so you would be restricted to this. Not, not a very attractive prospect for me. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, were I right Mickey Mouse, I would go back to the, you know, Floyd Gottfredson kind of portrayal of Mickey Mouse as a sort of brash uh, adventurer type character back when, when Mickey had a personality. And, um, you know, I would want to do that, but it's already been done, hasn't it? Uh, Gottfredson, he's, you know, the, the final word on this stuff. I mean, why go back and do anything? You're not going to, you're not going to do anything better than what he did. And he did plenty with the, uh, with the, uh, the daily and, and Sunday strips. So, um, you know, it's not something I would be attracted to. And besides, um, Louis Trondheim is doing a series of, of Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck graphic novels um, in Europe that are just amazing. And it, and it takes Mickey back to those days when he had a personality he was brash and adventurous and, you know, devil may care kind of character uh, and funnier. And, um, and like I said, had a personality. So um, he's kind of covering that beat uh, to, an, you know, doing some amazing, amazing uh, comic albums uh, out of Italy and France and places like that. And some of them are, are reprinted here. I suggest you look for uh, Mickey's Craziest Adventure. And then there's a companion uh, Donald um, Donald Duck volume to that, and they kind of uh, go together. The story continues in the in the Donald edition, and uh, just awesome stuff. Just uh, excellent comics. David, a lot of fans of noir pulp genre are of the opinion that these characters are best set in the original time period and cannot be successfully adapted to the modern era. I disagree. I think the issue is that these characters were never allowed to evolve. The problem with keeping noir-type pulp characters in the traditional era is that the bad guys are all played out. No one cares about Al Capone-style gangsters anymore. Nazis have been done to death. Mad scientists will always work, but the science itself needs to be kept up to date. I believe that a character such as a Shadow is capable of being a great modern-day era character. What is your opinion? Can it be done? I, I think it could be done. Uh, not by James Patterson but it could be done, but I wouldn't want to do it. Um, I like these characters set in the settings they're in. And I, I think you're wrong. I think there's a lot more to explore about the 1930s. I mean, I wrote a, a, a 
a uh, for an anthology, I wrote a, a like a novella or short story of the spider. He was like a shadow type character, except a lot meaner. Um, and uh, I wrote it in the style of I can't remember the name of the author. It was it was a female author. I can't remember her name, but I, but I tried to write it in her style. And she she was a big best selling author in the thirties, and um, I I you know tried to ate that style. That was the fun of writing it for me. Uh, was writing up a, a, a you know a pulp character in a um, sort of pastiche of a highbrow literature style. Uh, so that was fun for me, but I kept it in period uh, because I'm sorry, but you know Nazis are played out. Hey, I mean, scratch the surface on Nazis. <laughs> I could, I could. If you told me that all your bad guys had to be Nazis for the rest of your writing career, I'd be like, yeah, bring it on. Uh, because these guys were, you know, you know, the, they, they were designed to be bad guys. Look, the guy's got a skull on his hat. Uh, they, 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 they literally, um, you know, were created in the image of, of, a, of a comic opera villain with their costuming and symbology and, and well, and the stuff they did was pure super villain bad guy stuff. So uh, you know, trying to kill off uh, large portions of the uh, population of the planet, you know, sort of qualifies you as a super villain. Uh, so I don't, I don't think they're played out at all. Uh, still interesting, and the same goes for 1930s gangsters. Who doesn't like a, a period set gangster film? I can't think of a period set gangster film that ever lost money. Everybody loves this stuff. Uh, and it, uh, I, I, I think there's more stories to be told within this. I mean, what are you going to do? You, you're going to have the shadow going up against, uh, well, I could see the shadow going up against globalists. I could see the shadow taking down Klaus Schwab <laughs> or Bill Gates. <laughs> But um, but were, were I to write these characters, I would definitely want to write them in period. That would be the big attraction for me. You know, the cars, the way the people dressed, you know, everything about it. And, you know, but you got to you got to be um, true to the period. You've got to explore the period. Uh, to me, the best version of these was, you know, they would look like they were done then. They would look like an old movie. Um, like when uh, Mike Kaluta and Russ Heath did that um shadow graphic novel at, uh, I believe, Marvel with Denny O'Neill writing. I mean, it looked like a comic done in the period, which was a lot of the allure of it. So, yeah, I would, uh, I, I will have to agree to disagree on this. Slade Oron. What do you mean by high concept story? I've heard this term before, but I wanted to know your take. Also, are there then low concept stories? <laughs> um a high concept story is like one sentence. You know, Frankenstein meets Wolfman. <laughs> that was the elevator pitch. And they were like, yeah, that's a great idea. Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. And that's your high concept. That's what you sell to the audience. Uh, you know, other, you know, easy ones are die hard at a hockey stadium. <laughs> uh, sudden death with Jean-Claude Van Damme. I mean, that was... The pitch, die hard at a hockey stadium. Yes, yes, here's money. Go make that. Um, the the most dangerous man in the world, someone stupid enough to kill his dog. <laughs> and there you got uh, John Wick. I mean, uh, that was the pitch. You know, uh, guy gets his dog killed and stuntmen go crazy. Um, a family makes their young son move into a bomb shelter with them in the early 60s, uh, and they live there believing the world has been destroyed by a nuclear annihilation until the son goes out to get supplies and realizes that nothing bad happened, as his parents had assured him. And uh, romance ensues. Uh, blast from the past. It's, it's, it's a high concept. It's a, it's a simple idea that could go in almost any direction. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, most high concept ideas could be, they can be a comedy, they can be straight up action, they can be straight up drama. Uh, there's a million different approaches, but you're, you're coming off a very, um, uh, clean, pure 
sometimes single sentence description of of what's to happen in the movie, what the conflict is or what the hero's desires are, whatever. It's all there in one sentence. Uh, a lot of times they'll shorthand these, you know, it's, you know, quite infamously recently, a Star Wars director said that her Star Wars would be Kill Bill meets Frozen. And they seem to like that kind of thing in Hollywood. I always joke when they say, what's your story? I say, well, it's, it's kind of Die Hard 2 meets Die Hard 3. Um, so, you know, as simple as you can make it because uh, you're dealing with simple-minded people. I remember a, a number of times, it was a very earnest producer who's extraordinarily successful now uh, in TV. Guys like, you know, a, a stud in, in um, producing stuff for network television. But at the time, he, he, he loved Law Dog uh, and he wanted to produce Law Dog as a movie, but he couldn't get anybody to greenlight it because they... He couldn't get them to understand the concept of parallel universes. Um, so uh, I assume, you know, Law Dog is in a way low concept. Of course, today it's nothing but multiverse stories. And, you know, um, recently saw a parallel universe story nominated for Best Picture. Uh, it may even have won. I don't pay attention to the Oscars. Uh, but, you know, yeah. Are there low concept stories? Yeah, there's a few. There's a few out there. Um, it's not to say if it's not high concept, it's low concept. Um, but it's either high concept or it's not, basically. There's not really a low concept movie. There may be movies where they kind of lose the concept. <laughs> or there wasn't really a concept to begin with. Uh, maybe an agenda in place of a concept. But um, there you go. David Jordan, again, can I give you a few directors and you tell us what your favorite and least favorite movies they've done are anything else you want to add. Okay. Um, if we're looking at Michael Mann, it's gotta be last of the Mohicans. And I'm, 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 I'm being honest with you. I'm generally basing this on how often do I rewatch these movies by these certain directors, which, which movie by which director do I watch more than others? A lot of times when you're asked these questions, you're like, well, let me give it a highbrow answer or whatever. And you'll talk about, oh, I love this movie, you know, but you haven't seen it in 10 years, you know, because you're trying to show off. But Last Mohicans, I, I, I rewatch this at least once a year. And uh, I think it's Michael Mann's absolute masterpiece. And I'll bet you anything, if you sat Michael Mann down and, and, and got a couple of drinks in him, he'd admit this was his masterpiece too. Not that, that there's not anything to be proud of about this movie. Um, the Insider is probably the only Michael Mann movie I really just didn't enjoy. It kind of takes the talk about a, a, a low concept movie. It kind of takes the um, a sixty minute segment and expands it into movie length with Russell Crowe and Al Pacino. And I just never bought Russell Crowe as you know. I never buy him as the guy who's put upon, <laughs> you know, not really reacting, uh, kind of. Uh, a little bit wimpy. Uh, I didn't buy the conspiracy. Uh, it all seemed just too vague and lots of smoke and mirrors. Uh, it wasn't like direct and in your face uh, like a Michael Mann movie. And Michael Mann tends to be somewhat stylistic and this was all style over substance and even the style I thought was kind of iffy. Uh, for John Carpenter, The Thing, I like a lot of Carpenter movies. Um, I'm a big fan, but this is the one I watch most often or rewatch most often. This one gets a watch at least once a year. Um, it's a terrific adaptation of the original Who Goes There. And I, li I like the other Thing movie too, the one from the 50s with Ken Toby and Jim Arness. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of that one too. And I like the fact that both movies have an entirely different approach to the same subject matter. But yeah, it's got to be. And uh, Ghost of Mars is probably Carpenter's weakest. Uh, yeah, this is a low-concept movie. I don't know what the hell was going on in this movie. I didn't know what it was supposed to be about. Uh, it just seemed to be everything but the you know kitchen sink thrown in. Uh, I think that it was restricted on budget. I think Carpenter had ideas that he simply couldn't do because the budget wasn't there. Carpenter was always fighting budget um, and a master at fighting budget. I mean, Escape from New York was made on such a shoestring. If you... If you ever watch, you go on YouTube and watch how they did the miniature work and computer work 
on um, uh, Escape from New York and the corners they cut and the stuff they got away with that looks great on screen, but it shouldn't have, but they knew how to film it. And it was really imaginative approach to doing, you know, big scale, big budget effects, you know, on a, on a peanut butter and jelly budget. Uh, and, you know, just, he's it's just a terrific filmmaker. I, you know, he, he just never had like the super blockbuster huge O hit that would have lifted him up into the Spielberg, George Lucas uh, range, which, which he should have been in because he's such a creative guy. Uh, but, um, but you got to admire, man, that's a, that's a working man's ethic to, uh, I'm going to get, I'm going to, I'm going to put every dime on the screen uh, that I can. I'm going to, I'm going to find a way to do this, even though we don't have the money to do it. Um, for, um, yeah, Walter Hill, uh, Long Riders. This is one I watch most often. I, I like a lot of Walter Hill movies. I'm not as big a Walter Hill fan as a lot of people are. I think he's kind of, you know, sketchy. Some movies are really great. Some movies are not so great. Some movies are just sort of like, yeah, okay, I guess that was entertaining enough. Um, I, I think he he's, I don't know, there, there, there's a certain level. Of, you sort of get the idea of his style and his taste and where he's going to go with every story. Uh, Long Riders, I think, sort of defied that. And also, talk about a high concept. We're going to do the Jesse James Cole Younger Brothers Gang movie with actual brothers. The studio must have loved that because it did all the marketing for them. Um, but uh, in case you didn't know that, all of the characters playing brothers in this movie were actual brothers. Uh, the Carradines, the Quades, uh, and, and, and others. Um, the, uh, the, um, yeah, the leads, the keeches and, um, boy, my memory is shot today. Uh, Walter Hill's least for me is the driver. Um, Ryan O'Neill was so hopelessly miscast in this movie and this should have been one of Hill's best. I mean, it's about a getaway driver, you know? Um, but it's just, it's just not good. Uh, and, and Ryan O'Neill just, I never buy him. You can't buy him as a badass. You can't buy him as a tough guy. Uh, you know, when he displays anger, it's like, you know, he didn't get the table he wanted at Spago. Uh, you know, he didn't get the grade he wanted, um, in, in English lit. Uh, <laughs> he didn't make the Dean's list. <laughs> I'm so mad. I'm so very angry. Uh, and that's like the level of rage this guy can summon up. He's just not, he's not. He's not what you think of as a noirish character. He's too much of a department store mannequin. Uh, you know, in the right roles, he's good. But you know, let's admit it. Ryan O'Neill never had much range, uh, and sadly, it's a waste of Isabella Johnny, who is not probably largely unknown to American audiences, hugely popular superstar actress in France and in Europe, um, sort of wasted here. And I remember seeing this movie with a friend. And as we're watching it, we were recasting it. <laughs> we were recasting Ryan O'Neill. It was, you know, Harrison Ford, uh, you know, Bruce Dern. You know, it's like anybody but Ryan O'Neill. <laughs> um, for Ridley Scott, it's Black Hawk Down. This is I watch this at least once, sometimes twice a year. This is an amazing movie about the Mogadishu, the disastrous mission of Mogadishu to take out. Uh, uh, a uh, Somali warlord, and it's an amazing movie because he, he Scott, you know, manages to leap across a huge ensemble cast and keep you aware of where they are in the story, uh, ge both ge geographically and character arc wise, and uh, he keeps the action going. This is one of the most action packed war dramas ever. Uh, most of the running time of this movie is running and gunning. And I think it's a largely accurate portrayal. Uh, there's, it's based on uh, a terrific book. Um, and uh, unfortunately leaves out one of the best scenes in the book because I guess the studios were afraid of um, that particular scene, something that actually happened. Uh, let me just say, it's, it's how the American commander motivated the Pakistani troops to come to the rescue. Uh, it, it, Let's just say he was rather direct in an, in an Alan West kind of way. Uh, so, 
um, and the other amazing thing about this movie is I think this and Full Metal Jacket are like the textbook of how to block out a complex firefight sequence. Uh, you, as, as chaotic and manic as the action is in this movie, you're never, ever lost. You always know where you are. And uh, even though it's, you know, it's, it's quick edits, it's cross-cutting, it's this, it's that. Um, it's, it's just spectacular, uh, from beginning to end. And it's the one I watch over and over and over again. Um, my least favorite Ridley Scott movie, and I like a lot of Ridley Scott movies, uh, is Kingdom of Heaven. I think Orlando Bloom, just like Ryan O'Neill, was hopelessly miscast. Orlando Bloom is a very good actor. And I think he's got a lot of range. But I don't think he had a lot of help from Scott on this movie. And he pretty much just looks sad or pissed off for the whole running time of the film. He never like changes his facial expression very much. He's just dour and, and unrelatable. No, nobody can be that sad for that long. You know, uh, like you can't just be sad 20. I don't care what happened to you. Uh, and, and I've met people who went through traumatic, horrible experiences, but you would never know that a few years afterwards, you know, from their actions, from the way they would act. You know, their personalities still emerged. Their personalities were still intact. I think this is just a one-dimensional character. Yes, the action's amazing. And yes, I have seen the director's cut, which I do like a bit better, but not much better. Uh, and I think in its initial release, this movie had the unfortunate... Um, it's, it's weird because it had the unfortunate... I mean, Black Hawk Down came out post-9-11. And... Um, is is just a straight up war movie in which you know the enemies are you know Muslims, uh, and and there was no need to equivocate about that. By the time Kingdom of Heaven is made, we're we're further away from nine eleven, and and I think the studios felt there was a need to equivocate for the Saracens in this movie. They wouldn't just be straight up bad guys, and the original feature film version, it's, it's glaringly obvious that they're trying to um, really hard to make um, both sides th th seem equitable, seem the same, you know, two sides of a different coin or, or two different sides of the same coin. And um, I think the movie largely failed because of that, because, you know, who am I rooting for here? Um, the director's cut fixes some of that. And, you know, the historical record is, is that, you know, Saladin did honor his promise to allow the Crusaders to leave Jerusalem. Um, but um, yeah, I just, it, it's just a movie I just don't care for among, it looks gorgeous, but I just don't care for it um, as much as I like so many of his other movies. Um, now his brother, Tony, it's gotta be Last Boy Scout. Uh, of all the movies that Tony Scott made that I like, I really like True Romance, I really like a number of others. Um, Last Boy Scout is a movie that, for some reason, I went to see over and over again at the theater when it was in release. I must have seen this thing six times on the big screen. Uh, it's worth a watch every year. Shane Black's insane screenplay. You know, sort of send up of the private eye genre, which he's done so many times, but never did as well in this movie. This movie's a zany and goofy and has so many terrific lines, so many terrific action set pieces. And, and, and it really fits Scott's... Um, you know, super slick style of filmmaking and uh, great chemistry between all of the lead actors in it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one that's just, for me, compulsively watchable. His weakest, and probably everybody in the world is going to agree with me, is Domino. I don't know what the idea behind this movie was. I don't know where it went wrong. It's supposed to be based on a two, true story. Not one second of this film feels authentic or real or true. Uh, Kira Knightley isn't believable for even um, two frames in this movie as a freelance bounty hunter and slash fashion model. Um, I, I never looked into the real, quote unquote, real story behind this movie. It's, it's supposed to be factual. I can't believe it, it had to be like some public relations person's uh, fevered dream that any of these events were created. But yeah. It doesn't work for a second. And Scott sort of goes on overdrive with the uh, 
cross cutting and and you know uh, uh, you know fade outs and double exposures and all the rest. It's just it's a mess. It's just a heartless, joyless mess. Uh, for Howard Hawks, boy, it is hard to choose. My, my favorite Howard Hawks movie. I a, a a film critic that I read regularly. Uh, he wrote that when people say, you know, if you if you had to go to a desert island, what movies would you take with you? And he said, I would take every Howard Hawks movie with me. And he says, and I'd be good because it would. I'd have every genre. I'd have crime. I'd have comedy. I'd have romance. I'd have westerns. I'd have action adventure. And he's right. Hawks excelled at every single genre. And uh, of all the movies that I like, you know, bringing up baby. His Gal Friday, I mean, over and over and over again, I, I, I watch these movies. But Rio Bravo is probably the one. I, I think every six months I put this movie on. It's sort of my default movie. Like I don't want to want to watch. Oh, I'll put on Rio Bravo. Uh, Love this movie since I was a kid, and uh, I just I just dig it a whole lot. John Wayne, Dean Martin, Ricky Nelson, uh, Walter Brennan. You know, uh, just just a great ensemble cast. In um, in a, in a really fun Western that's just expertly made from, from beginning to end. Just a terrific movie. Uh, Hawks' Worst is a uh, man's favorite sport. <clears throat> it's a it's his attempt to, to, to do a screwball comedy, except it's set in the 60s, and, and sort of the days of the screwball comedy are over with. Uh, Hawks has kind of lost his touch here with the timing. The casting of Rock Hudson um, is, is poor, Rock Hudson was coming off huge success being in a number of movies with Doris Day. And I think Hawks thought, well, I'm going to work into that genre. He's, here he's teamed with Paula Prentice. And uh, it, it, it's, <clears throat> it's just a mess. It's, 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 a, it's a Doris Day movie without Doris Day or any of the charm or pacing or fun or froth of a Doris Day comedy. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, he was nearing the end of his career and just sort of, he just would have been better retiring or just keep making Westerns. <laughs> would, Cause he, he kept, you know, I think after this, he just stuck to Westerns, which is, which is what he should have done. Hey, one more thing. Um, last time out, I believe it was last time out. Somebody talked about writing for the trade and there's an element that I forgot to mention. You know, writing for the trade back in the '90s, we were very aware that trade paperbacks were the thing. They were with us, and and most of our comics we were writing for the core titles were going to be collected. Uh, generally, a year later, they would be collected into trade volumes. So our editors began to say, "Start thinking about the trades." In other words, start thinking about you know, six issue arcs, or the number of arcs that would fit into six issues. You know, don't end your sixth issue on a cliffhanger. Uh, try to wrap things up, you know, either through your, your one-shot stories or whatever, so that they fit nicely story-wise into trades. And a lot of writers took that to mean, well, I can pad my stories out or I can leave all the action to the end of the story. You know, I'm just writing one big long story, which, you know, I, as I said previously, was a big mistake because you still have to make the reader of that monthly installment happy you know the monthly installment has to be good it has to stand on its own as a piece of quality entertainment and uh not just part of a greater whole um you know not just sort of a a fill-in issue where you, it's all exposition or or set up for something you've got to have every every comic book story you know mainstream superhero action type comic comic book story has to have setups and payoffs within each installment of wh however long your arc is. And I think when when some writers heard writing for the trade, they just sort of thought, well, I don't have to do that anymore. But you do. <laughs> oh. But the, the aspect that I, I, I left out was um, the trade allowed you to properly dramatize things. There was no reason... You had no reason to shortcut anything because you were writing a longer form story. Uh, in most cases, you you had time for those moments, those uh, 
you know, Tony Soprano going to feed the ducks moments, you know, character building moments or, or you know, uh, dramatized moments. And an example I always use is the first issue of Commandi by Jack Kirby. Jack Kirby created Commandi over a weekend. I mean, he had, he had a title canceled and he had to replace it. You know, Jack, we're canceling this, but, you, but we still have a slot open at the printers. Uh, if you can come up with something over the weekend, we'll fill it with your, this new number one. So he comes up with Commandi, and, and it's wonderful. It's, it's a fantastic concept. I love Commandi. The only thing about Commandi I don't like is, is the, his origin um, is, is so brief. He, he, Kirby gets, is in such a rush to get to his main concept of, you know, of, of a young boy emerging in a post-apocalyptic world populated by talking animals. Um, he's in such a rush that he sort of gives short shrift to, you know, where does Kamandi come from? Where, you know, what's the, the precursors to this story? Where, where, where did the story really begin? And um, see, if, if Jack was writing for the trades or had more time, he would have spent that whole first issue on Kamandi's background. Uh, and then ended it with him meeting his first talking animals. Uh, but, you know, Jack didn't know how long the series was going to run. Jack didn't know anything about trade paperbacks. They were going to be decades in the future. And uh, so he did what he did. But, um, you know, but I, I would say had he known he was writing a longer form story, he would have taken more time, more care with the, uh, the beginnings of Commandi, And, uh, you know, before the main events of the story. Hey, if you have suggestions, questions, you know, whatever, pictures of your dog, your cat, or you just want to talk, <laughs> contact me at brunobookstore at gmail.com. Brunobookstore at gmail.com is the most reliable way to reach me. And uh, if I can remind you once again, uh, book 12 of Levon Cade is currently out and doing well. People seem to be liking it. And uh, Levon's Trade, the movie, starts filming in just a few weeks. Uh, I keep checking IMDb uh, <laughs> to see the progress. And they, they've hired everybody, even the drivers. So this looks like it's really going to happen. <laughs> so it's set up to start filming with Jason Statham uh, in, in just a couple of weeks. So I'm excited. I hope you are too. And uh, that's it for me this week. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for liking. And thank you if you have for sharing this with all of your friends and family so we can build this channel and uh, keep those questions coming. I'll see you down the road.